I was always fat, heavy. It's funny, because now I would be normal with the way everything has changed. People are all bigger. But then, you would have thought I was the hugest, grossest, most Goliath thing that anybody could have imagined. I remember just wishing people could drop it, you know? I couldn't get through a day of school without some wise ass thinking they were being smart. Smart. Smart was me. People think you're stupid or retarded when you're big. Far from it. We were all going ape, literally, because we'd seen the apes movie, the very first one. You blew it up. Wow. I mean, that opened us up to a universe we hadn't even thought of. Time, space, everything. I used to love making paper airplanes, trying to go for the longest flight. I remember because it was one of those times where I wasn't a size. I was just another excited kid. Me, Daisy, and Jean would hang out together. Jean was an asshole even at that age. He grabbed one of my new planes, crumpled it, and tossed it on the pavement. Fat boy cannot fly, he said. Actually kind of funny. He actually was kind of funny. A shithead, but funny. To be fair, he even came back after class and said sorry. I was pretty impressed by that. We'd call it a teachable moment now. I told him I'd like for people just to find something more interesting to talk about, not just make jokes about my size. He said he'd heard about my dad dying. Well, at least it wasn't the usual. I'd asked for it. But then he surprised me and said he wished his dad would die, which freaked me out. How can you say that, I said. He started saying how he wasn't really his dad and stuff, and that wasn't common back then. So I'm thinking like foster kids in Africa or something. He told me his foster parents kept him locked in the garage. Well, maybe not locked, but it sounded horrible. Drunks. Daisy was kind of a pal, though. She liked to eat, though she kept that side of herself from Jean, who was always so pissy about fat people. I'd see donut sugar around her mouth, though. This old prison. It's funny, I actually liked school, at least the learning part of it. If I could have been invisible, I could have stayed in school forever. Mr. Fucking Spencer. What a dick. They always say they want you to be original. Then when you try it. <laughs> we were doing interest talks, and I guess I should have done another lame one about the fucking snowy owl or something. The thing is, I loved music. Cool music. So I brought in my tape recorder, and as I walked up to the front of the class, everyone was cracking up. As I said, being invisible would have been great. What's the fat kid gonna do now? The usual shit. I got up there and played the song, did some air guitar, and started singing. Or rather, I tried to sing, but all that came out was this little squeak. Not like when I was practicing at home. The class went apeshit, and Spencer must have panicked because he pulled me out of the class and started ragging on me.
He said I was gifted and shouldn't disrespect myself in education. Blah, blah, blah. You know what? I'm a teacher. I teach. And guess what? That makes you a student. And you're here to learn, right? You want to be a student that doesn't want to learn? You're not welcome in here, right? I'm here to teach. I'll teach the other 30 kids that want to learn. You know, I know you got a brain in that thick skull of yours, but for some reason, you think everything's a joke, right? So you know what, as far as I'm concerned, my classroom door for you is locked. Until further notice, you are not welcome in this class. You know, and I'm even going to have to phone your mom. I mean, how embarrassing is that? How old are you? Do you think I want to actually, like, phone up your mom? Man, like, I'm more embarrassed about that than you are. You don't want to meet your potential? Well, guess what? Only people that want to meet their potential are welcome in my class. I'm here to teach. You're here to learn. Until further notice, you're evicted from this class. Because I just want learners in here. And you know what? You don't take it seriously. So you're out of here until further notice. Mom, yeah. By the time I got home, she had laid out some cake and pop for me, then proceeded to light into me about my weight. She was obviously pissed because of Spencer the asshole. Word traveled fast. I'm tucking into the cake, and it's all about, who's going to give you a job if you're huge like your father, bless his heart. Yeah, Mom, I get it. Nice cake. Thanks for that. You're going to be interested in girls someday. Oh, trust me. I was interested in girls. And music. Miraculously, I survived into adulthood. Leo helped, though I was always a survivor, despite the low expectations of everyone else around me. I followed my love of music into Leo's record store, where he definitely needed some schooling in punk. Oh, he was plenty weird, but in hopelessly old-school ways. He lived on a boat, drank too much, and spun stories of the good old days when he was some kind of musician. Or so he said. To be fair, Leo was one guy who didn't harp on about my weight, which was even more impressive by then. Instead, he harped on about me learning how to play an instrument. He was like Rocky's coach, and he never let up. Oh, it's Fat Punk. FP, Fat Punk. Get it? Cool. A Fat Punk. I love it. Oh, a Fat Punk. Fucking gigantic one, too. A pig of a punk. I remember bumping into Gene, Daisy, and a bunch of others on the way to work, all punked out, wannabe style. Gene had taken a major hate to me by then, and Daisy kind of tagged along. 
I just kept trying to bring them into the store because I knew shit about punk. To Gene's credit, he was the one who had the genius to turn my name, Francis Paul, by way of FP, into fat punk. And yeah, it stuck. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, Catholicism. Francis Paul. Fuck. Really. Thanks for that. Here you go, here's that delicious soup for you that your mom likes so much, and here's that other stuff. Bruno was a nice guy, and also my candy bar connection. We had a kind of code. He knew I wasn't getting boxes of chocolate bars for my scout troop, and I knew he knew. And he knew I knew he knew. But it worked. We'd keep up the fiction for what it was worth. Mom was in permanent dying mode back then. It was like old Fred on TV with his coming to join ya shtick. She barely got out of bed, at least not when I was there and would only eat soup for supper. If I brought it, it was always too cold. If anyone else brought it, even cold, it was just right. Whatever. She was dubious about my interest in music, though it was good for skinnier people. I got more of those donuts you like and there's pop in the fridge. Yeah, thanks for that, Mom. Lasting tunes and catching up on punk zines was where I lived. Daisy. She worked at the donut shop by that point. We weren't that close anymore because she seemed to be in the thrall of Jean, who was determined to be an asshole. One night she was getting ragged on by these skinny punk bitches who were saying she was too fat to be a punk. Let's just say I showed them what fat really meant. She sat with me on this bench after and I offered her one of my candy bars. She seemed amazed that I would be nice to her, but I mean, why wouldn't I? I said something lame like, we people have to stick together. Ugh. I must have walked past that poster a dozen times, but something made me grab it down that time. I guess I had figured it was something other people did. Skinny people. Of course, Leo had to see the poster and start ragging on me to enter the Battle of the Bands. I'm like, what? I don't even play an instrument. <laughs> Famous last words. Kind of like our first adult date. I mean, kind of. It was for me. For her, I think she was just saying thanks for helping her out with those skinny punk bitches that night. She had her donut shop apron on and she smelled like donuts. I was afraid I'd pop one right then and there. She was like this creamy dessert. She hated the smell. I guess it was like the smell of enslavement. To me, she was like a giant donut full of Bavarian cream. I remember sitting here just sniffing my hand from where her donut scent had touched my coffee cup. Mmm, wow. 
But then it seemed kind of hopeless because she was so in tight with Jean and I figured the worst. We did start meeting up here though. One time she drops a bomb on me telling me Jean is her brother. What? I must have been as red as a beet because I was truly lost for words. But, 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 yeah, says she, he's an asshole. Then she explains about how they got fostered out, a term I then understood, to different homes. Their original mother was a junkie who died of hepatitis or something. Again, I'm blown away. Real families didn't have junkie parents, right? So anyway, it was a sad story. And she got sent to this nice religious type family and Jean got dealt off to a couple of alkies who locked them in their garage. I wanted to make her feel better about her original mom and all, so I told her my mom was really sick. She immediately got all sad for me and my mom. That's kind of how she was. Leo decides to have another heart-to-heart -heart talk one day. He'd already had more than a few sips from his coffee mug and was kind of emotional. He'd been over to visit mom and bring her soup the night before. Back then, I never thought much about how often he visited her. But anyway, he was saying about how sick she was and how she's worried about me and all that. Now, I'd been hearing the sick and dying routine for a long time, and it was a little bit like the kid who cried wolf. Leo seemed really serious, though. He started doing the whole follow your dreams thing again, and I humored him until I get fed up and said, what about you? Look where you ended up. I felt bad for ragging back on him like that, but he took it and got all serious and said that's what he meant. Then he tells me a story about how my dad always wanted to learn to sail on one of those little boats. And I'm like, what? I don't think so. And Leo says, yeah, but he wouldn't go down to the beach until he lost a few pounds. Always wait till next year. And then he died. Yeah, I was aware that he died. Thanks for that. Anyway, he keeps haranguing me about becoming a for real punk rocker. And I'm like, what, a 300 pound punk? And he's like, you're damn right. I wanted to get away from the fumes, so I humored him and said it out loud like he ordered me to. At one point, I'm shouting, I'm gonna be a punk rocker at the top of my lungs, just to shut him up. My mom was getting worse, and I was getting crazy. I was happy to do things for her, but at the same time, I was desperately needing some space on my own to just be and munch down on some bars and get into punk world. She had this bell she would ring, like a fucking princess or something, and I'd just lose it after a while. One night it was up, down, up, down, ring, 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 and I snapped. I lost it. She called me nice boy for the millionth time, and I can see it was crappy of me, but I stormed out of the room and just started writing. It was my first song. Why don't you die? Oi, oi, not a nice boy. Oi, oi, why don't you die? Oi, oi, not your fucking toy. Oi, oi, <laughs> man, the anger. You fucking delusions and ringing their bells Makes my life a bloody fucking hell Not only that, but you're starting to smell Can't you figure out you're not gonna get well? Why don't you die? Oi, oi, I'm not your nice boy Oi, oi, not your fucking toy Oi, oi, you seem pretty nice but you held me down Made me up to be a fat, hapless clown Like everyone else, I keep letting y'all down now you can live with the seeds you sown. <laughs> the anger. Wow. I mean, it needed work. But now I can see that that was the moment I got angry enough to grab for it.
I decided to press my luck a little with Leo. I was feeling punchier since laying down those lyrics. How come he never talked about stuff, but he kept on at me all the time? I asked him about his wife and why he never talked about her. He like crumpled a little and I immediately felt really bad. I told him sorry and that I'd back off, but he got quiet, said that she'd died and that he knew I'd heard that much. It was a bad kind of breast cancer, the worst kind, and that she had weighed nothing at the end. I asked about kids and he said they weren't like that, just a couple of hippie free spirits. He looked really sad and I felt so bad. I tried to encourage him like he did to me and, and asked if he'd ever met anyone since. He said something I never forgot. That with a love like theirs, it was as if they had become one person, their rib cages intertwined forever, something like that, and that he was just waiting to cross over to join her. Now, it was always hard to gauge just how drunk Leo was at any given moment because he held it so well, so I never knew how much faith to put in what he said. I still felt shitty for bringing it up, though, and I think I just said, don't go too soon, or, or something lame like that. He said he had to keep kicking my butt, and we left it at that. Oh, yeah. Fucking Leo. I had to admit he'd gotten to me, drunken old bum. I had to go get Leo the next day down at the marina. I made him promise to never lock the boat in case it caught fire or something. It was really a floating booze can from what I could tell with some mementos and things. Basically, he lived like an animal when he wasn't in the store. This is one of my favorite memories, waking him up looking like this. Anyway, I wake him up because he was supposed to meet me an hour ago, and he comes too, beaming like he's seen the light of heaven. I cracked open the hatch a little more because he was florid with bourbon. Something about his wife coming to him in a vision. That she said he deserves something good to happen. Whatever. I got him up and we headed to the store. He was lit up in every sense of the word that whole day. That day was different than the others. I got home expecting mom to be her usual whiny, sicky self, and I was feeling hard done by. Like, when am I going to be allowed to have a life? I called an ambulance. The last thing she said to me was, there's something I want you to have and you'll know it when you see it. days. What elegance. It's so nice to meet you. Your mother talked about you all the time. She was so proud of you. She was such a really good actress. I loved watching her act. I was beat. Totally drained. But what really struck me is that I must never have really known my mother. Not in any real way. Mostly what I'd ever got from her was this vague sense of shame about all of us, me, dad, even herself, about us being fat. 
Yet she always made sure there was plenty of pop and donuts around. I never did figure out what was behind all the digs. No college would take a fat kid my size because they'd have to get a special chair. How could I learn to play music because I hadn't stuck with recorder when I was in grade two? I mean, what the fuck? It was a stupid little plastic whistle with holes in it. But if I got pissed off or walked away, she was all over me with the praise and sympathy. Like, oh, I just worry so much for you. I love you. You're such a nice boy. Nice even then struck me as a death sentence, a ticket to failure. And her theater? What was that about? A whole side of her I never knew. Leo came by with some food, which I appreciated. He gave me a hug, and Leo was not the huggy type. I appreciated the hug, too. I was wallowing, and I feel bad about it now. It's like all I could think about was myself when it was Mom who died. Let's face it, it sucked more to be her. I understand now that's what happens when you get raised by a self-absorbed parent. You aren't real to them except as an extension of himself. Anyway. Leo started spinning some Leo story about his dead parents, his dead wife, the whole Leo thing. He said my mom left something with him to give to me. What the fuck? He slides this envelope across the table. It said, Dear son, for once she didn't inflict the full Francis Paul on me. Thanks for that. It wasn't easy for you to look after me, but I dearly love you for it. Always have, always will. I'm so proud of you. There's something I want you to have. You'll know it when you see it. And then the check fell out, and I just collapsed. I thought we were so poor. Another mystery shrouded in a lie. I completely lost it right then and there. You're actually a fairly well-off young man now, especially for this neighborhood. Your mother wanted you to be taken care of. I knew her, actually. We were in showboat together. Emma was a fine actress well together. If there's anything else you need, give me a call. She had already arranged things with Mr. Griffiths from the bank. I realized later that Mum knew a lot of men. I came out of my wallow and went back to work. I banged down the poster and called Leo's bluff on teaching me. Well, he didn't miss a beat and pulled out this bass and start showing me stuff. He was lit up like a Christmas tree, and not just because he'd been working on his mug, but because he was actually showing me stuff at last. It was as simple as I'd hoped it would be. Bump, bump, bump. I could instantly see bashing out some punk tunes. Leo pinned the bass on me with its tiny strap, and it felt like a brooch or something. <laughs> we lost the strap, and then I started to get a real feel for it. I'll never forget when he plugged me in and I plucked at the strings. Womp, womp, womp. Yeah, I was making noise and that's what it was all about. There's something I want you to have and you'll know it when you see it. Aha!
I called it in to the local music rag. Outrageously different guy seeks punk bandmates to form band. Oh, and possible record deal. My mom was barely cold, but I was already becoming my own man. I waited. In the meantime, I practiced a bit more with Leo and dropped my new lyrics on him. It was called Surprise Yourself. The lyrics went, You've been fucked over being told to wait, but deep inside you know you're great. Surprise yourself, give it a try. Surprise yourself, we're all gonna die. They keep you down, tell you to hang around, point at the clown, laugh when you frown. Surprise yourself, give it a try. Surprise yourself, we're all gonna die. Nothing to lose except the blues. So put on your shoes and make some news. Surprise yourself. Give it a try. Surprise yourself. We're all gonna die. You might just surprise yourself. Surprise yourself. Surprise yourself. It was kind of lame and bubblegummy, I guess, but Leo went nuts over it and immediately wanted to set it to music. It kind of was about him anyway. I'm glad I listened to the crazy old bastard because we soon had the thing set to music and I was ready to rock. Leo surprised me by offering the basement of his shop in the back alley as a rehearsal space. The funny thing is, I couldn't have asked for a better crop of misfits in response to my ad in the paper. Seriously, it was dead easy to pick the band because the few sad sacks who showed up were perfect, except that they couldn't play and had no gear. But whatever, it was DIY, right? Surprise of the night was Daisy showing up having bolted from Jean's band after some squabble. I suddenly saw that we had a band. There's something I want you to have. Hmm. Well, yeah, there was. And I was seeing it. We even gave ourselves punk band names. Oh, man. Shredder Slice. Anarchy Slam. Daisy Chains, and me, Mammoth Zero. Holy fuck, the power of mass delusion. You'd think we were the Beatles or something. More like the monkeys, maybe. Ah, but it was a rush. I mean, we were there with real guitars and shit, a couple of songs, and you know, we were actually doing something. It was like, surprise yourself for real. Leo, the sweetheart, even surprised us with Fat Punk's t-shirts he had made up. It was like really happening. Stuff didn't happen back here. Not then, and not to us. We were actually doing it. We were making music. I was in a band with my girl. We had even kissed by that point. And then Leo got us this funky van. It was lightly used, he said. Whatever. It was amazing. But then the wheels fell off everything, not just the van. Daisy got press-ganged by her good-for-nothing brother into quitting our band and joining theirs. I can be whimsical about it now because I know how the story ends, but at the time, I completely fell apart. 
my world was gone. Then Leo was gone. I was late to work that day and the store was still locked. That just didn't happen. There was no amount of alcohol that Leo could consume that would make him late to open the store. I went down to the marina and Finn was there. He told me that the boat was gone, Leo was gone, gone, everything. Even the crap on the dock was gone. We called the Coast Guard, but nothing was found. Nobody knew what happened. FP, I don't know anything more than you do. I wasn't here last night. I got here this morning. His boat's gone. When I saw that boat gone, my heart sank. There was no note from him. He took all his stuff and... Uh, I worry about him. I've been thinking about it ever since, and uh, when he's been drinking and he's on that boat, nothing good can happen. Okay. Okay, so you know where this is going, right? The all is lost moment. Our gear was gone, though they left the van at least. Lucky me who got to update what was left of the band on our current prospects. One day I get a letter from that good for nothing drunken asshole Leo. All about how, hey kid, if you're reading this, then you know I'm gone. And I'm like, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Thanks for that. He went on in Leo speak. All over to you. Sorry I couldn't be more upfront with you about the finances of the place and stuff. I really liked having you there. You mean a lot to me. You should net out okay with what's in the bank. I want you to win that contest and put FP's Punk Emporium on the map. Always go for it. You might just surprise yourself. I'll be there in spirit always. Your pal, Leo. Great. Uh, thanks, Leo. Not long after that, Daisy comes in with Gene like he's being dragged by the ear. Turns out, Gene can get our gear back. Ah, right. Imagine that. Nothing like connections. Asshole. Then Daisy drops that she wants back in the fat punks. <laughs> what? And here's where it all went down. The old grotto club. Mick was a local impresario type with vague bullshit pretensions of having known all the greats in rock and roll. After he got fired from his grocery store job, he had lucked into a club that had gone downhill steadily enough that it was ripe for punk. Its final incarnation was the Grotto Club. Mick made a few bucks and some free booze by hosting these Battle of the Bands contests. He even got profiled in a music magazine at one point. I mean, he wasn't a bad guy, and we did blow that contest and Gene's band away. Surprise of the night goes to the man in the goofy pimp hat at the back of the club, Leo. He showed up later with a pizza and a bottle, a big one, and said he had some explaining to do. Yeah, like no shit, Sherlock. I could have brained him, but I was actually glad to see him. Like all his stories, I never knew if it was all bullshit or just 90% like the rum he brought. Blah, 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 gambling debts into deep, 
sailing away to Mexico, a new wife who maybe was his old wife, who maybe wasn't dead, whatever. I let him run on and down, and he crashed in the store for the night. He did like what I'd done with the place, the school and all. We changed a lot of lives with that punk school. Outsider kids had a place to belong and to be cool. I said to a reporter around then that I'd never wanted to be famous or anything like that. It was always about the music and the message, and about belief, and about other kids who'd been like me. Yeah, it was cool to get our demo record pressed and a bit of local press, but the greatest day was when we threw open the school doors for real. Never really got a chance to tell you, but I want to thank you just so much. Like my experience at the punk rock school has just changed my life. Like everything has just worked out so well for me because of everything that you've taught me and shown me at the punk rock school and now I'm a music journalist like I always wanted to be and it's awesome and I can do just everything I ever dreamed of. Thank you so much FP. You rock. You really do. You don't know what you've done for me. All the time you used to tell me to come up by that school, the things you taught me carry me and move me forward today. You wouldn't believe what I do and you couldn't believe what you taught me. All those times we'd come in there, we'd always jam inside the room there with music, learning the notes and riffing and improvising. I was able to learn a lot from you and I wasn't out on those streets too. But then I walked in that first day and I was judged on the merits of what I could do, not what I looked like. And that was, that was such a powerful moment. I mean, look at what I've done. And I don't think I could have done it without you and without the school and it's a testament to your strength and your courage that people like me have succeeded, that we found a place that makes us feel like we belong. I sure loved her. Love her. She hung on to the school and shop for a good while, then gave it over to Jean, who now has a wife and family of his own giving what he never got. I'm happy for him. Daisy, I know I'll see again, soon enough, but not too soon for her sake, in our little fat punk donut part of heaven. Dear Mom, I can see now how fully you cared for me, and I'm really thankful for that. I can see now how hard things were for you, losing Dad so young and putting everything you wanted to do on hold. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for giving me a home to live in, and thank you for giving me the things I needed to get through school. Thank you for the note of encouragement you left and for the money, which was an amazing surprise. Thank you for saying you were proud of me and that you loved me. I can see that clearly now. I had some resentments, but they don't seem to matter much anymore. Thank you for being you. I love you, and as you like to say, always have and always will. <laughs>